Warning! This program contains strong adult language, violence, and brief nudity. It's everything you're looking for. Live from the Sims Tower in the Robinson Auto Group studio, we are AM 1600 WKKX. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Whispers Radio here on AM 1600 WKKX, the Valley's Watchdog, and UPRN, the UFO Paranormal Radio Network. Also, see, I need to, like, switch it in. Past TV Network and Past Radio, or, yeah, Past Radio Network are also carrying our recorded programming. So i got to figure out how to link all that together. It'll make it sound pretty. Yeah. <laughs> First, I'd have to remember it all. That's <laughs> Brought to you problem. by everybody who likes yeah. us. Yes. How about there we that? go. That's good. That's good. It's 6.08 p.m. My name is Jordan Klein, and here with me is the, <laughs> well, the favorite. Be kind. The favorite, oh, apparently, according to Facebook. True. Well, and Facebook never lies. <laughs> and Facebook never lies. <laughs> Lola Miller. <laughs> uh, they were going on and on and on about you today. That's scary. Yeah, you know what happens. I know. Uh, give Thank us a call. Thank you. Thank you, fam. Talk to your people, Lola. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my. <laughs> give us a call, 304-214-1600. If you're out of the area, call us toll-free, 1-866-514-1600. Before we start, I want to thank everybody at Brook Hills Playhouse. I had a wonderful experience out there this summer in Laughing Stock, which you missed. Jordan, it was very, very funny. They keep changing my work schedule. I know. Like, I I, I worked six midnights in a row, and it was, like, all through your play. I know. No, I was just teasing, because my sister was in the same position. She didn't have the opportunity to see it either. How come you didn't film it? If I was in a play, there'd be a camera in the back. There was. Well. I'm waiting. I have to pick it up Wednesday. Well, then I get to see it Wednesday. Yeah. How about that? See? Mm -hmm. See? I didn't stand you up. It's, it was just very fun. But I want to thank everybody out there. That w- it was really a great experience. And I found out the Playhouse is haunted. There's a little girl that makes herself known periodically. And she did one night. Not in front of me, mind you. Never in front of me. But uh, to one of the younger actors out there, Amy. Yeah. So, interesting. So, so, to say what Amy saw. Well, she was in the dressing room by herself, and, and in most dressing rooms, you have mirrors, because we love to look at each other, um, you have mirrors on all the walls, and so she was facing one and saw the figure in the mirror reflection moving in another mirror, if that makes any sense, and then she also heard somebody calling her name, so, this hey, is really Amy. Like that. This Break a little leg. girl, it was a little girl, Amy. Amy. I just find kids that are bad. creepy. I know. Even if it was a real kid sitting there saying your name, creepy. Mm-hmm. See, and I like kids, but when they're alone, they're creepy. Oh, please, yeah. that's just wrong. You know I'm right. Yeah, I know, but I wasn't going to say it. So. <laughs> you know I'm right. But I had a really good experience up there. It was a lot of fun, and and they do six six plays every summer. Really? And I don't know how they ever keep the schedule going because. A play will run for two weeks. In that two weeks, some of these kids are already rehearsing for the next play. And then that we strike the set on Sunday afternoon, and they have dress rehearsal on Tuesday. Wow. So it's, yeah, some of these kids have been in every single play this summer. It's it's a crazy schedule, but it's a, it's a lot of fun. And I told them, you know, I'd love to audition next summer and see what I can get. Just it's a. So are you only in the one play yeah. for the summer? Yeah. Do they like audition for like all the plays all at the same time, and you just decided one? No, or? I think they do the first three at one audition, and then they do the second three. But see, every other one too is a musical, which huh, leaves me out. What? I'm sure oh, your no, voice is can... angelic. Yeah. Uh huh. Oh, you want to yeah. hear a siren song? Good grief. <laughs> Although I, I was told, well, we could put you in the chorus and you could just mouth the words. <laughs> watermelon, watermelon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we had to sing Old Lang Syne at the end of this one, uh-huh. you know, and uh, it was like everybody. There were some people in the cast that could sing, but they kind of made it bad 
you know, so that the rest of us that couldn't sing didn't sound so horrible. Okay. <laughs> it was pretty funny. But, yeah, it was a lot of fun. It's good times, though. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. I miss that already. Yeah. When, when's Not the really. next one? Do you, oh, have, I don't, do you have any other um, that you were in? Because you, you're in a lot. No, the, the next round of auditions won't start for another month. And that'll be for Towngate. So we'll see. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. Well, I'm going to get our guest on the phone. Okay. All right. Uh, I want to let everybody know that WKKX.com, uh, you know, if you want to get in there, if you want to, like, hey, I want to want to listen to the show, but uh, don't want to sit out in my car, go to WKKX.com. You can listen to it. And not only can you hear it, not only can you hear it, but there's a webcam now. And you can see my pretty little face and my cool blue T-shirt because... Biff, who just left, me and Biff were like twins. I know, it's scary. Biff like came out, he's like, hey! Like, we're wearing pretty much the, the same thing. The twins, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, get on there, check out the webcam, check out me. Oh, listen to If this. If I get enough uh, messages here, maybe on Pal Talk, maybe I'll turn the camera over to Lola. And absolutely not. No, you won't. So our... No, 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 no. Oh. Go look at this. It was my property of St. Vincent School's T-shirt on, no makeup. Except you look me. ravishing, my no, dear Lola. No, I do not. <laughs> Probably have, I got raccoon eyes, don't I? I was rubbing my eyes, and all that mascara from the play is still on them. <laughs> there like, you go. Do See, I? No, no, I can't tell. I'm across the room. But you have your glasses on. That doesn't mean anything. Okay. <laughs> oh, we got a guest in line? <clears throat> yes, we do. Lamont is on the line. Our guest that? tonight, Mr. Lamont Wood, his book is Out of Place in Time oh. and Space. We're talking about inventions, beliefs, and artistic anomalies that were impossibly ahead of their time. Lamont, are you with us? Yes, I am with you. How is it, sir? Uh, um, pretty good. Um, we're talking about, of course, my book, and... Um, where shall we begin? It's uh, kind of a big topic, and it uh, covers a bunch of stuff. But um, I, I uh, started putting it together when I started. I kept running across these examples of things that really kind of stuck out from what you would expect in the flow of events or, or any simple linear uh, expo- uh, historical uh-huh. uh, and, uh, and, uh, any historical retelling of history, anything linear. Then they're just, they're just things that don't fit. So I put them together and basically made this book. Um, uh, the best example, I think, is the one I lead off with, um, the so-called Virgin and Child of Toy Helicopter on page 17. And it's a um, detail from a religious painting that's uh, hanging on a uh, wall of a museum in France. It was painted in 1460, and it's fairly uh, straightforward composition with the Christ child sitting on the Madonna's lap, and there's a saint over the one side of the show in this, uh, this detail. But anyway, when you look at the Christ child, you realize he's holding a flying toy helicopter. And that's not really what you expect from something painted in 1460. Um, so I, like I said, put, it, put together, again, collecting these things, and the result is the book we're talking about. Uh, uh, I, when putting this together, I was looking for some high concept that would uh, kind of stitch all this, these things together that I kept finding. And I came up with the idea of what I call the reverse anachronism. The um, reverse anachronism. Yeah, reverse anachronism. Now, an anachronism normally is when you like go to the movies, the movie's about Rome, and you're speaking English. That's an anachronism. <laughs> but you accept that because you don't know Latin, right? And you don't want them speaking Latin up there. Or, or sometimes you'll, in the background you see that the extras are wearing or wristwatches or something, and that's, that's a little jarring, but you, you, you manage to overlook that. Okay, now, I reverse So anyway, in that, that sense, it's a non-threatening sense, is uh, things from the past that appear in, in uh, uh, modern things that appear in, current, in, in contemporary depictions of the past. Okay, reverse anachronism would be things from the present that show up in the past actual beliefs or, or physical, even physical objects, uh, such as a flying toy helicopter in 1460. And, uh, and when I started looking for them, I kept finding them. You'd think it would be freaky, something freakish, but I, like, I kept finding them. For uh, instance, uh, uh, Archimedes, for instance, people kept 
when I talk to people about this, they keep expecting Leonardo da Vinci to keep coming up. But actually, uh, Archimedes does, because he had uh, much better financial backing, I think. He apparently was in charge of the defense of the city-state of Syracuse, and uh, which was besieged by the Romans in uh, 212 B.C. But uh, thanks to his uncle being the, the warlord or something, they had been had something like 50 years to get set up. And... Um, and when the Roman navy attacked the walls, these, these uh, big machines reared up over the other side of the walls, picked up their ships, and sank them. And uh, this, this is not science fiction. It shows up in three different uh, ancient chroniclers, uh, at least one of which was obviously uh, working from uh, first-person accounts. Uh, like I say, that's not really what you expect, is it? Um, uh, but it goes beyond that to... Uh, but you know you can explain such things away by you know good engineers think along the same lines. He obviously came up with something that would resemble modern tower cranes that use construction of tall buildings, uh-huh. of, you know the upright pil- uh, pillar and then the, the, the boom that goes out horizontally. It presumably he had a number of things like that. Um, uh, and, and like I say, good engineers will think along the same lines. And he had pretty much unlimited financial backing apparently. Uh, but then you run across other things that you, you can't really be explained away that way. Um, and probably the best example would be uh, a novel Jules Verne wrote in 1865 called From Earth to Moon. Have you ever read it? No. No, I haven't. No, okay. Okay, well, anyway, he describes an American space program that puts a, a aluminum capsule with three men in it uh, t- uh, to circle the moon and come back and land in the Pacific Ocean, where, is it, where it is picked up by the U.S. Navy. Does any of that sound familiar? Yes. yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, now, uh, he, Jules Verne's wrote a bunch of other stuff, too. Uh, some of it's science fiction, some not. And science fiction stuff usually is fairly obvious uh, projections of technical uh, event, uh, trends that were going on during his lifetime. Nothing in his lifetime, especially, especially in 1865, would point to a U.S. government program to send men to the moon purely from national prestige. Uh, we don't know where he got that. Um, uh, another good example uh, would be uh, the moons of Mars. Uh, they were discovered about 1877, I think. Uh-huh. Uh, but they were described 150 years earlier uh, in Gulliver's Travels by Jonathan Swift. Uh, and th- that's pretty weird. And... Um, now, as I point out in the book, if you do the math, his Swiss description of them really isn't that technically accurate. Uh, so he apparently was guessing, although why he would guess along those lines and get to that point, we, we have no idea. But, but there we are. And um, uh, am I going too fast for it? Oh, no, no. I'm, I'm fo- I got the book in front of me. I'm, I'm following mm-hmm. on. You actually talk about the moons on Mars on page 11. Yeah, it's toward the end, yeah. <laughs> And um, did you ever see the movie uh, uh, 2001 Space Odyssey? Uh-huh. Uh, that, I have another chapter on that. That's the, uh, uh, that was based on the Saturn's moon Iapetus. And uh, originally, when they first discovered it, uh, it seemed to, like, uh, appear and then go away, uh, which is why uh, Arthur C. Clarke decided there was something mysterious about it, and he wrote this novel around it. Uh, when they made the movie, they, they moved the moved it to a moon of Jupiter because they couldn't come up with a really realistic looking Saturn. Uh, but anyway, um, they eventually decided that it was appearing and disappearing uh, because one side was, you know, white and the other side was black, apparently. One side was covered in snow and the other was something else. And when modern space probes got there, they, they found that was the case. Um, but there, uh, And it looks like there's a, like a big splash of uh, dark material on one side of it. But within that splash of dark material, there is uh, a very straight line ridge that follows the uh, planet's equator almost exactly and makes it look like a walnut or maybe badly constructed ping pong ball or something. And that no one can explain. There's no I, no rational or irrational explanation for that. This, but anyway, that's uh, just an example. But anyway, going back to... Uh, the reverse anachronism thing. Uh-huh. Um, if if we have things from the, the present showing up in the past, 
uh, logic would demand that there are things from the future uh, in our present that we don't recognize what they are. And you would think that's not possible, but then you realize that all these things in, that are now in the past or something, they were at one point in the present, you know, time moves. Uh, a good example of that would be uh, the so-called Antikythera mechanism that was found uh, on, off an island, of, uh, off a Greek island in 1901. And uh, at first they thought it was just a jumble of gears. And after about 100 years of analyzing it, slowly trying to figure out how it goes back together. Okay, this is a picture in your book too, right? Yeah, yeah. The on, gears? That's chapter 2, in fact, yes, uh, page 20. After about 100 years, literally, of analyzing the thing and lately using computers to help do that, they realized that it was a ancient computer. Uh, not in the programmable uh, digital sense, but in a, as, as an analog computer in the old sense of like uh, artillery firing mechanisms or something, we have all this gearing arranged to uh, do a particular task, uh-huh. uh, which in, in that case apparently was to reconcile the, uh, mostly to reconcile the uh, solar and lunar calendar. Uh, they use both calendars then as we do now, as you know, Easter doesn't dress around because it follows the lunar calendar. Um, but uh, it used uh, planetary gearing, which no one thought existed until the Industrial Revolution, but it was made about 65 B.C. Julius Caesar could have consulted. Um, many, many years before. <laughs> yeah, many. I mean, we don't know how how they had, had all that technology, but there it is in front of us. Uh, and and like I say, no one recognized it for what it was. To go back to my original premise, until it kind of came into sync with the present, and then then we could understand it. Now that implies that there are things uh, and are hanging around right now that we're incapable of understanding because they're, they may be from the future. And I don't know what those are either. But uh, my favorite candidate would be the so-called Voynich manuscript. Um, that is a, a medieval hand-lettered, hand, uh, hand-illustrated manuscript dated back to about 1420 on vellum, several hundred pages written in a language that they have been unable to decipher. Uh, it appears to follow the rules of no known language. Um, could it have and just it, been gibberish, though? Yes, it could have, that, as I point out there. Uh, someone, some middle e- medieval person could have had OCD and had, you know, and just had to scribble all this stuff. But on the other hand, it is also filled with illustrations that appear to illustrate something, but when you look at them carefully, they match nothing. I mean... There's like plumbing and botanical stuff, and it doesn't match anything known. Uh, astronomical, appear to be astronomical uh, information that matches nothing that we know. Um, and usually when, when you have compulsive people writing down stuff and inventing languages and, and filling in artwork, uh, usually it's based on something real. It's ba- when you analyze it, it's, it's based on their own language. And, uh, and eventually the, they draw a picture based on something you know recognizable this never happens this goes on for 200 pages or so and it, it never happens with this one so uh you can say uh, who knows it's all up in the air at this point there have been people who spent their careers trying to decipher it, assuming it is decipherable and that no one's come up with anything convincing that's pretty pretty amazing actually uh, yeah no, uh, um, I, I, I do have well first we have a question uh from Excuse nora's me. boy uh, okay. Does Lamont have any sp- or speculation about Leonardo's painting revealing ET contact, such as Lita and the Swan? Uh, no, I don't have any speculation on that. Uh, okay. I think he was. I assume he was firmly rooted in his time, and he didn't. Uh, and he didn't need any ETs to tell him what to do. Basically, uh, had they told him what to do, uh, probably uh, he would have. Uh, not have, uh, what am I trying to say, uh, messed around in these peripheral projects he was on. He was cut to the chase. Uh, had been. But, um, so no, I, I really don't have any, any uh, theories on him. Now, now, looking through the book, a lot of the paintings, uh, when you touch on the paintings, like UFO, yeah. you know, showing right. up in paintings, I mean, it, it's pretty amazing, actually. You know, uh-huh. uh, yeah. pictures of... Yeah. Okay. Madonna and the UFO. There, I mean, there is an yeah. object right. flying in the sky. There's a uh, right. Uh, it says UFOs in 1350. One of them that's a uh, painted mm-hmm. on the top of a dome. You know, of Jesus mm-hmm. crucifixion. Right. And there's an object on each side, kind of. Okay. You know, pointed, okay. and they have people floating in them. Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay, but you have to. You can look at this as I point out. You have to. You, can, you need to look at this two different ways. One, 
is us projecting our own Im- uh, uh, definition of images onto what we see there. And two, uh, the uh, definition of images they were using back then, they had a fairly established system of iconography uh, in the Middle Ages and the Renaissance. Uh-huh. And, um, and usually, except for that very first one, which is, which is the most convincing, and generally you can fit it into their system of iconography. Uh, and you don't have to rely on it being uh, an actual depiction of a UFO. And in fact, and, and to point out a couple of cases, when you manage to get high definition images of it, you see it's, it's a band of angels or something like that. Now, in some of those cases, no. And uh, you, can, you can take it either way. But uh, as I point out, if, you know, we, we have to use, you know, Occam's razor, which is that the, um, the simplest explanation is the best. Admittedly, sometimes the simplest explanation is not true. Um, you're probably not old enough to remember the, the Watergate uh, no. <laughs> thing. Okay, well, what turned out to be true was absolutely the most complicated explanation for what went on, the thing that everyone dismissed immediately. Why would the president be doing all this nonsense? Of course, they're just making this up, you know, and, but it turned out that the opposite was true. Um, but in the absence of that, you have to go with the, what they call Occam's razor and, assume, and you know, and assume that whatever requires the invention of the fewest assumptions is the way to go. And, and in this case, the fewest assumptions is that they're using their established iconography. Um, am I answering your question here? Yeah. But, but on the other hand, you know, you can't prove, as I pointed out, you cannot prove a negative. You know, you can't prove no unicorns, that you can't prove unicorns don't exist. No one's seen one, <laughs> but maybe we'll find one tomorrow, you know. You, you cannot prove a negative. Uh, so, you know, I'm not going to burst anybody's bubble, you know, if you want to believe that these are UFOs. Well, they do kind of look like that, don't they? But on the other hand, uh, there's also things in the, in the pictures that don't look like UFOs. Uh, who knows? You know, I mean, whatever. Um, Lola's got the book now. She's uh, perusing through it. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, the thing from 1350 always is especially, uh, I think, a good example. Well, uh, on, on, the like, cover, on the cover, you have kind oh. of a zoomed-in version. Right, right. I think uh, it's on it's page me. 180 for those of right. you who have the book. Yeah, when, when I first looked at it, I thought, you know, for some reason, uh, he has a boat out there in the sky. And uh, obviously, apparently, we're in the mountains looking down. And you look at the rest of the picture, no. They're on the ground looking up, and that's in the sky. But, but also, you look at it and say, like, well, it's the nativity scene. It's a fairly standard nativity scene. Uh, in which the Madonna is in a sort of a shed, and it's open in the back, so you can see, and you can see the landscape. There's some livestock around her, and of course, Christ child, in this case, John the Baptist, there as a, as a slightly older child. And uh, but anyway, behind her, you, you can see uh, some landscape, and the landscape has uh, shepherds and sheep. Uh, so that, you know what you have to do to illustrate the gospel uh, account of the nativity, because it includes. Uh, sh- shepherds uh, seeing the you know the, the the angels by night and making the announcement, and and that's what's going on in in the background. You see, angel uh, shepherds with sheep around them are looking at this thing in the sky. So we, I, you have to presume that that's what the artist is trying to illustrate the mm-hmm. the holy presence of angels. Mm-hmm. In, in this case, he looked like looks more like water damage. I, I don't know, I mean, <laughs> but. Uh, <laughs> So, um, uh, the one from Kosovo in 1350, uh, like I say, it looks like little uh, mercury capsules. Yeah. But, uh, but again, uh, especially in uh, Orthodox uh, iconographic tradition, there's, uh, in the crucifix, there's usually uh, a, a solar image and a lunar image in the sky. And the solar image is usually red and male and moving toward the cross, and the lunar image is usually silver and female and moving away from the cross. And if you look at them, you, you can't see the colors in this one, but yes, one of them is male, one of them is female. The male is moving toward the cross, and the female is moving away from the cross. So it fits. I mean, uh, that's the sun and the moon, and it uh, is there because uh, the Gospel of Matthew, Mark, and, and Luke say that on, from noon to 3 p.m. that day, it was dark. So you have to have something indicating the changing of light conditions. Oh. So, or you can think they're 
UFOs. I mean, I'm not going to pop, pop your bubble here, but I do have to point out that, you know, once you go to the library and look it up, all the stuff leaps out at you. <laughs> now, did you do a lot of the research on your own? Like, where did these... Uh... Who, oh, all who of it. Yeah. These, did anybody no, specifically bring these pictures, you know, to your attention, or uh, the publisher brought these pictures to my attention, but they just listed them. They didn't say anything about them. They oh. just said, "Please, please mention these." Okay. So I, I did all this research that you see here, and uh, uh, and they didn't say a word about it. And everything else in the book is basically derived from my uh, very my researches and just just random reading, basically. On uh, page uh, 98, you bring up the Dogen tribe? Yes, yes. You want to tell us about uh, that a little? Okay, that, that has been... Uh, okay, well, I, I mentioned some things in here uh, that sound like reverse anachronisms, but uh-huh. when you get there, they're, they're noise, and this turns out to be noise. Um, the Dogon is a, a tribe that lives in Mali, which is what used to be called French West Africa. And uh, based on an interview that an anthropologist had with... Uh, a local uh, uh, shaman of some sort, um, people get the impression that they were uh, aware since time immemorial that um, Sirius, the brightest star in the northern hemisphere, is a double star. And um, and I point out that, well, let me ask you this. Um, if, are you, uh, if you know what the Big Dipper is? Yes. Okay, have you ever noticed that the... The second star in the handle is a double star. No. Uh-uh. That, that, you never noticed that. Okay. No. Uh, okay, those two p- stars are uh, essentially 11 arc minutes apart. Now, you know, a, d- a degree is about uh, uh, twice the width of your, no, about the width of your index finger at arm's length. And a minute is, of course, one sixtieth of that. And those two stars are called Mazar and Alcor. On a, on a good, on a good clear night, uh, dark night, a person with average eyesight should have no problem, you know, telling them apart. The average person should be able to do, uh, detect things about half a minute apart. But Sirius A and B are, are they're like uh, about like ten uh, arc seconds apart. A second is one sixtieth of a minute. Uh, in other words, you, physically you could not tell them apart, even if one of them is not, one of them is actually hundreds of times brighter than the other, and even if they were farther apart, you couldn't distinguish them. Yeah. Um, so anyway, uh, when you look at it, and and basically uh, some other anthropologists put, uh, put a great deal of effort into trying to confirm his findings uh, several decades later, and they couldn't come up with anything. So basically, it's a good story, basically, but it, but it falls apart in the face of, uh, of any analysis. And also, uh, the, the members of that tribe have been serving the French army at least since World War One, and some some of them have been officers and stuff, and college education. Some of them, you know, read astronomy books. You know, you follow me? Yeah. Uh, and Sirius has been known to be a double star since about 1852 or something like that. So, I mean, so uh, a little cross cross cultural contamination would would uh, Play explain into. all this. Now yeah. we do have to take a break. If you want to stay with okay. us. Uh, okay. You're listening to Whispers Radio. Call us, 304-214-1600, toll-free, 1-866-514-1600. Our guest, Lamont Wood. We will be right back. Welcome back to Whispers Radio here on AM 1600 WKKX, The Valley's Watchdog. My name is Jordan Klein. Her name is Lola Miller. Our guest tonight, Mr. Lamont Wood. We are talking about... Oh, hello, sir. Oh, yeah. We do... uh, We we were just looking over the break. Um, Lola pointed out a Charlie Chapman... Chaplin. uh, Chaplin video. Have you ever seen... It's on YouTube, and it's Charlie Chaplin's Time Traveler, and it's a piece of film that they filmed outside the theater before one of his movie premieres. Mm -hmm. And there's a woman walking past, an older woman, and she looks like she's talking on a cell phone. Mm -hmm. And um, somebody brought that to my attention months ago. And it's always kind of, you know, intrigued me because Mm -hmm. it kind of... it, she's it does. definitely it looks like she's, looks
Yeah, but, you know, it also looks to me like she's scratching her head with a cigarette case. So, uh, uh, but yes, it, is, it, is, it does leap out at you, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, that was amazing to me. Mm-hmm. Why would she be scratching her ear with a cigarette case? Well, maybe she had one in her hand, she smoked, and her ear was itching. You know, That's like, true. Yeah, her, her, her hair was, you know, flapping the wind or something. Yeah. So, uh... Uh, we do. Uh, we got another question from the chat room. Um, in the book, uh, you have Prince Hal's surgery, right? Um, wants to know if. Uh, hold on. Uh, there are, are are there paintings of how badly his face was damaged from the arrow, or? Uh, uh, no, and uh, he probably would not have approved of that anyway. The only um, uh, painting we do have uh, does show him on the. Uh, on that side, and it shows you there's no real scar there. Um, and that was probably done on purpose. Uh, he wanted to show that he was not disfigured. Uh, but, but no, this is a long time ago, and we don't have a whole lot of pictures of him. Uh, and I can guarantee you they, they didn't take a portrait of him while he was in pain. And his face <laughs> was so so uh, that, that's in, instead of people saying, you know, that was, uh, you know, he, uh, facial surgery healing... You know, mm-hmm. good. That was, uh, you know, in actuality, he just said, paint it like I'm normal. Oh, mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, or he said, you know, or maybe he wasn't those people who did say warts and all. Maybe he said, you know, fix it. Uh, we don't really know. But but the painting does seem to indicate he's not disfigured. Um, there were people argued that, that it left him with a changed personality, but we don't <laughs> didn't we don't know a whole lot about his personality before he was injured. So, uh, <laughs> but it, but he was near death. This was in 1403, I think it was, and uh, and he was hit in the face uh, below the left eye, or about even with the nose, by a, a war arrow that left its arrowhead deep in his flesh. And, and of course, the the uh, uh, those those uh, arrowheads were not really attached to the uh, arrow shaft. For, for, uh, they did that on purpose, so when you pull it out, it left the uh, arrowhead in there where it would fester and kill you. Oh, that's nice. Um, yes, they did that on purpose. And um, But since he was a crown prince, uh, he got uh, the level of care that most people probably wouldn't get, and uh, the guy who operated on him left an account of it, and when you read it, you realize this is antiseptic surgery. Uh, we don't know... Uh, he doesn't say why he did what he did, uh, but it is clear he was using antiseptic procedures, washing it with uh, uh, honey and turpentine, for instance, and uh, and keeping the wound open with uh, things, uh, wooden uh, probes, I guess, that were also treated with uh, things that would be generally antiseptic. Uh, and then he made uh, a special tool to extract it that would be kind of hard to uh, explain on radio, but it's basically it managed to clamp the inside of the uh, uh, arrowhead socket and 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 uh, put pressure on the outside so it actually clamped it from the inside. Oh, wow. And, and then it was able to withdraw it from deep inside that wound after. Uh, and then and then slowly let it close up. Uh, it must have been very scary for all concerned. He, he doesn't mention anything about uh, pain relief, and we hope that's because it was too commonplace to mention. I really hope something was going on. This was a very ghastly situation. Wow! But uh, like I say, this, this, you usually don't ex- you don't expect antiseptic surgery before 1867, which was actually when it was invented. But here we read about it in 1403. The, uh, you know what? That doesn't really. I mean, yeah, I guess. But it really doesn't surprise. I think there were a lot of things that went on in. You know, be, long before very accurate histories were made that mm-hmm. were lost and then, right. you know, found again, and they, they discovered antiseptic surgery. Well, probably many times, yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, well, well, the thing is, before the uh, invention of the publishing industry, uh, not just publishing, but the publishing industry, uh, you, you couldn't expect the kind of diffusion of knowledge that we now take for granted. And two, a lot of people uh, worked under the assumption that secrecy is good. Yeah. Uh, they, they weren't going to disseminate the knowledge. Well, no, if you uh, were a physician, say, to, you know, the royal family, you wouldn't want every country doctor 
um, stealing your reason for being the celebrity or being the one that they would call. Oh, yeah, I'm you know? quite sure of that. So, yeah. So it's a different world, different attitude. Mm-hmm. You know? and, uh, but uh, as I point out, like the, the Romans were known to uh, use braziers to, to uh, heat up their instruments just before they operated. Uh-huh. Yeah. And uh, they, did, they didn't know why that helped, but they discovered it did. And, of course, we now know that they, they, were, uh, this is, you know, they, they were killing the germs. Yeah, uh, they didn't know what germs were. Well, Lola also brought up something during the break about the Egyptians doing you brain know? surgery. Yep. Mm-hmm. You know, right, and, they did do that. Yeah. Oh, it, it goes back. To, we find that uh, amongst uh, in Stone Age situations, the trepanning or whatever it's called, where you make holes in the skull yeah. to presumably release uh, the spirits. Uh, release the spirits, or just to, to help with uh, skull fractures. Also, it would actually do that release. Uh, but we don't know, you know, how to learn that was a good thing to do. That seems like a stretch, you know. Probably just, by oh. accident. Somebody yeah. slipped, right. you know. Oops. Yeah. Oh, look yeah. at this oh. hole. Gee, yeah. the guy's yeah. getting better. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, you know, before metallurgy, you know, the most, most uh, fighting uh, injuries would have been, you know, from clubs, you know. And uh, so you would have skull fractures rather than punctures. And uh, But how they would know that actually making a hole there would, would help, you know, that... You're right. That had to be done by accident. Yeah. Well, I figure the first potato was cooked on accident. Okay, yeah. <laughs> really? You know, in the first meat, you wouldn't, you know, how would they have thought that process out unless a piece of meat fell in the fire and somebody picked yeah. it up and went, hmm, this is tasty, right. you know? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Okay. Um, uh, but I also point out that um, some technologies... Ancient technologies were are just lo- were lost and later rediscovered. A big example would be concrete, and uh, as a building material, which people, modern historians will say, you know, went hand in hand with the industrial revolution and helped the expansion of cities and everything like that, which is all true. And you can pay, and you can trace it back to a patent in 1799 in England or something. This is all true and easily verified. Except you go to Italy and look at some of the Roman ruins, you notice they're made out of concrete. Yeah. And and obviously they knew how to do it, uh, but uh, that was all lost at some point. Um, uh, and I, in the book, I also dwell on the Pantheon in Rome, probably the biggest surviving uh, concrete building uh-huh. uh, from that period. And um, and for one, uh, we if, uh, what am I saying here? It's built with modern methods for one thing. Two, we don't know why it was built. It serves no real purpose. We, we the, the there's this basic mystery hanging over the thing. Um, we wouldn't build it that way. We would build it with rebar. Uh, they built it without rebar, but managed to get it to, to last this long. Um, but uh, it does not follow the uh, rules of a standard Roman temple. Uh, uh, usually, well, anyway, the Roman temple had fairly standard architectural features for fairly standard purposes, none of which are present in the Pantheon. We really don't know why it was built. Really? Yeah, there were the various theories, and they, they usually attach to it. Pantheon, you know, it means all gods. It was temple to all gods, but uh, yeah, that's that's what I heard. That it, you know, it was kind of like the temple for everything. Yeah, but it, it's not a temple. It's not a temple building. Um, and uh, other theory is that it was built as a uh, a war memorial to the Battle of Actium, uh, uh, and the, there's a. Uh, and the inscription on the front would indicate that it was built by the victor of the Battle of Actium, the one that defeated uh, Anthony and Cleopatra. And the um, uh, trouble is, we, we know that guy uh, died about 150 years before the Pantheon was built. <laughs> so it was not built by him. Uh, so it's, it's all up in the air. We don't know what was going on with this thing. Uh, you know, we think we know a, lot about, know a lot about the Romans and stuff, and then there were these huge holes we fall into. Um, okay. Um, but my favorite story in the thing is, being a, being a writer, uh, my favorite example would have to be a story about W.T. Steed, Victorian journalist. Um, he was in on the foundation of the, uh, what we know, the, tablo- the, the tabloid genre, the, this news of the world thing that got yeah. shut down yeah. four weeks ago. Yeah. Well, uh, he was in on the start of all that, with the sensationalism and the crusading and everything, and um, and in the eight, in the eighteen eighties, and uh, and at one point he got on this uh, crusade about admiralty laws, which did not require passenger ships to carry enough lifeboats for everyone, 
And he even wrote this fairly detailed account of what would happen if there was a collision in the middle of Atlantic, the middle of the Atlantic, and the passengers discovered there weren't enough lifeboats, and panic would break out, and all this other stuff, and it went down, and, and all these people would drown, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, and um, uh, he got rich uh, from his magazines, and uh, at one point uh, decided to attend a uh, anti-war conference in Chicago, and of course, bought a first-class ticket on the best accommodations oh, available with kidding. the Titanic. I'm not kidding. <laughs> and uh, and you have to wonder what was he thinking? You know, <laughs> we'll never know because he went down with it. We we don't know. He didn't he didn't make it. We yeah. So so talk about déjà vu. I mean, yeah. probably the ultimate déjà vu. We got a caller. Was, we, okay. Who we got? Yep. This is Bill, and he'd like to ask you a question. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Uh, yes, sir. Early on in the program. You mentioned that in the past, in their presence, there was something of the future. Is there an example of that today? Uh, okay, okay. In the past, in the present, there was something from the future, and you think you can, you, you, you have been able to perceive some. Well, no, I mean, you, you said that. Oh, okay. In, uh, yeah. Uh, my, uh, what I say is that logic demands that there would be, but that we would not be capable of recognizing them for what they really are. Uh-huh. And uh, we just have some, uh, I have some candidates, but uh, only the course of time will be able to confirm this. At some point, maybe we'll figure it out, you know, when it comes in the, into uh, tune with our then present. Now, when, this, when it matches you, the things we then know. Are you talking uh, time traveling or just uh, there might be something no, about, in our. No, I'm talking uh, about the rather prosaic time passing. And, yeah. and and we realize suddenly that this is what it was all along. Pre- so there might be had... something in our present that is of the future, correct? Yes, there might be. Uh-huh. But we won't, I mean, we wouldn't even yeah. know. We won't no, know exactly. until no. the future happened. Yeah, yeah, we won't know until until, uh, until the present and the future kind of match. Um, is, I, I, I go out on a limb in several places and say that we uh, we don't really understand time. You probably realize that. It's yeah. not something that we can, you know, put in a test tube and, and isolate from anything else and, and come to understand. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think it, it may be uh, that is really uh, uh, an artifact of our uh, perceptual framework. Uh, whether time really exists or not, I don't know. And it may not, but we can't tell the difference because it's built into the way we perceive things. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, uh, so what I'm saying, the passive time may be an illusion. Uh, if there are time travelers, we don't uh, we don't really know what they would want to do or how they would act. You think so there's a parallel the things, universe? Yeah. Well, okay. some of the things I have in the book, you know, they, they seem to cry out for a time traveler the explanation that some time traveler came back and did this. Why would they do that? Why would they think like we do and want and, and do the things we would want them to do? You know, mm-hmm. uh, they would have their own agenda, and we have no we have no idea what that would be. I also, that. Yeah. also, earlier on, you know, since no one's ever seen Bigfoot or a vampire, uh, could there be a Bigfoot or a vampire? Well, uh, again, we have to go with what's called Occam's razor and admit that the uh, explanation that requires the fewest assumptions is the one that go- to go with. And with Bigfoot, you have to accept that there's a fairly large mammal running around out there leaving... No uh, hard evidence of its, of its existence, and also that's able to b- find other members like itself and continue breeding. Usually, a breeding population you, you need about two hundred individuals, really. And the fact that there's been one occasionally knocking around here and there, wildly separated. I mean, you, you'd see it crossing the road occasionally, like elk. Or so <laughs> therefore, there, there probably is. It. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Hey, thanks, thanks for your call, Bill. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I think also a good example of, uh, I guess, his question and your ex- explanation for those of you uh, out there listening would be like uh, Star Trek. You know how you know he had, you know, things that looked like, communi- you know, communicators, you know, stuff that people were like, oh wow, you know, and thought nothing of it. But by the time cell phones are out, it's like wow, you're looking back at it. Oh, they had cell phones on that show. They had yeah, right, know, yeah, and clunky ones too. Yeah, yeah, you know, it's it kind of looking back. And saying, mm-hmm. "Oh wow, we had you know that person looks like he had that, but it wasn't okay." Yeah, mm-hmm. I get you. Right, but the big anachronism was the way the women dress in the, <laughs> the original <laughs> Star Trek. You say, oh yeah, that was made in the sixties. <laughs> 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 but anyway, 
<laughs> yeah, God, I hope we don't go back to those styles at some time in the future. Jeez. Mm-hmm. Oh, come on, Lola. <laughs> oh, yeah, oh, I look yeah. great with big hair. <laughs> well, oddly enough, uh, one of the examples I give, uh, Albert Robita, the uh, uh, the French cartoonist from the 1880s who wrote all these books about the 20, illustrated books about the 20th century, he did always include women uh, with short headline, hemlines, very pretty young women usually. Of course. Uh, <laughs> but you can probably imagine the reason for that. Yes. But he, but he also had all these like flat panel video display screens, two way, you know, and these people going around immersed in uh, an information environment that they're getting from all over the world, and uh, people people. Telephones everywhere, you know, yeah. and uh, high-speed air transportation and stuff like that. All, uh, I mean, uh, ch- change a few, uh, you know, the descriptions, and, and he's nailed it pretty much. Uh, not so much for he, he places his story in twenty in uh, nineteen fifty two, but if you move it up to about you know twenty oh five or something, it, it, it is very convincing. Now, uh, real uh, quick, we only got like three minutes left. I, I want to ask yeah. you real quick about the uh, water erosion with the Sphinx. Okay, right. Uh, what What are your thoughts there? Uh, I think that um, it may be older than they original, originally thought, but uh, whether it's 8,000 years old, uh, you see, it, some people say, well, maybe uh, at some point the plateau was uh, was graded such or because of the way the construction was going on that the outflow was directed over the sinks, and that's why it has all this water erosion, whereas things next door to it, you can see the original chisel marks, you know, and... and uh, 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 so I think that that's a reasonable explanation, but I don't know, you know, I think we really need to pay more attention to this. I think it requires more explanation, mm-hmm. more, uh, more examination. Yeah, thank you uh, very much. I, I, I want to thank you, Bill, for uh, being on the show. This is not Bill. Bill. Bill was the caller. <laughs> Lamont, sorry. Okay. Uh, where, uh, where can we get your book for those out there? Okay. Uh, Amazon is selling it. If you just go to... Uh, Amazon and put in uh, out of place, and, uh, it'll it'll pop up, and you can order it from there. I'm I'm told it's in major bookstores too, but it, the, it so it, it may not be. It, it, it's just released last week. It may not physically have shown up yet at a given bookstore. But if you walk in there and demand it, I'm sure it'll. He'll order something. it for you. I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you know, yeah. get get ten copies, burn nine. Read. <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> no, I looked through it. It's really interesting, and it's it's. There are short chapters, so you know mm-hmm. if if, you're, if people are afraid of sitting down with this massive tomb that you're not going mm-hmm. to be able to really get yeah. through. You know, it's not like that. The chapters right. are very short, and they're very you know contained to it, one it's, thing. It's about you know e- each like each subject that we talked about tonight. Like you know, here's this painting. Let's explain that painting. Talk about it some right. next next chapter. You know, yeah. right? It's basically forty magazine articles. I, I'm. A, I'm professionally, I'm a magazine writer, and that's what I do most of the time. And uh, and this is basically 40 or 42 magazine articles. Well, that's good. And, I mean, that's and, uh, an easy way of putting things together. Yeah. <laughs> I preferred it. <laughs> <laughs> it worked well. Yep. Yeah, it worked well for me. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Lamont Wood, I want to thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, well, very yeah, informative, pleasure. very inf- entertaining. Uh, okay. And uh, we'll like to hear from you again when the next book comes out. Okay, hopefully that will be the new foreseeable future. Great. Okay. Great. Oh, you got <laughs> okay, your bye-bye. dog. Or, mine's been here barking, too, so. <laughs> okay, yeah, I better go. <laughs> All right, See thank you. you. Bye. Bye-bye. All right, we're, we're out of time. He did, before we uh, the show, I, I talked to him, and he's, he's like, well, if you're recording, if my dog happens to bark, can, can you edit that out? I was like, yeah. Well, the whole time it didn't bark, and here it is, like, right as we're hanging up. Well, it knows it's time to go. <laughs> All right, yeah, we are out of time, everybody. I want to thank you very much for listening and being a part of our our little shindig here. Mm -hmm. Until next week, don't be afraid. Only believe. believe.